Super. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I think that people will probably come in as we go along here. Um, but first off, uh, my name is Phoebe Ayers. Many of you know me. I'm a Wikipedian. I'm also a librarian at the University of California, Davis. And it is my pleasure to introduce and moderate this panel about open access. Um, and so we call this Open Access in Wikipedia, opening, opening the world's academic research to improve the world's most popular reference source. And I think that encompasses what we're going to talk about today. We have five panelists who are all leaders in the open access movement and also experienced Wikipedians, Wikimedians, who are involved in open access. And before we begin, I will give a very quick introduction um, to the topic. Um, for those who may not be familiar, and then our first panelist is going to give a more in-depth introduction. So open access, the open access movement aims to make scholarship, and especially publicly funded scholarship, but really all scholarship, freely available to all, which is opposed to more traditional models such as academic journals that require very expensive subscriptions to get access. There are many models for open access. I'm not going to talk about all of them. There are many funding models and there are many licensing models. Um, but the general concept is that open access makes research available to everyone. It makes research available to all. And it also helps expand research impact by lowering the barriers for citation and reuse. And this is an exciting time to be involved in open access, right? There's a lot of energy around the topic from governments and institutions all over the world. There's been a lot of work recently in the US. My own institution, the University of California, just passed an open access mandate this week while we've been at Wikimania, um, which is exciting for me. Um, but there's a lot of energy around this topic. And so this panel will explore that synergy, the growing synergy, between Wikimedia and the open access movement, and discuss ways on how to reuse reliable and free open access content on the Wikimedia projects. Um, we'll try to get ideas and discussion from all of you, um, and especially around the topic of how, the value that opening up the body of scholarly and scientific research could have for the Wikimedia community, um, and how we can encourage and ourselves um, more, participate more in the open access movement. All right, so with that, I will introduce our panelists. We have five panelists that are each going to give a short talk, and then we're going to all be up here on stage, and I hope have a good discussion. This is a long session. It's the full 90 minutes. We ought to have time to um, really get into the issues and ideas. I hope that lots of people in this room do have ideas um, and comments. And if you have a question for a particular question for any presenter, um, feel free to ask them as they're presenting. Otherwise, we'll have a discussion about the big issues at the end. Thanks. Um, all right, so our first, our first panelist is Nick, Nick Shockey. So 
Kristen is the founding director of the Right to Research Coalition, um, which is an international alliance of 71 student organizations. Um, this represents nearly 7 million students in over 100 countries. Does that make it better? Uh, uh, the advocate for free, open, and online access to all scientific and scholarly research. Aha, uh -huh. let's wait for everyone to come in. It's a little distracting. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome, friends. Yeah. <laughs>
You know, even if you're a student at Harvard, you still run into these problems. But really, at any university, it's you know, I think something that's pretty universal among people that have ever sort of interacted with the research literature. Um, so this is a great example of something you know that we're actually trying to get access to. Uh, academic research journals, unfortunately, don't come with price tags. Uh, I wish they did, but we'll put one on it anyway. Um, yeah, so I'd like to uh, ask a couple people to guess how much they think an institutional subscription to this journal called Tetrahedron might cost. First, you want to say what it is? What, what is it, this is a journal in, I believe, inorganic chemistry. Um, so any ideas for how much? 15,000? People that don't know. <laughs> And I'll, <laughs> yeah. So uh, for an institution in Hong Kong uh, with around 10,000 students, it would cost about $23,000 a year for a subscription uh, for, for one year. This is in Hong Kong. The dollar, no, the dollars are, sorry, that's very confusing. The dollars are American, but this is for an institution, this price is for an institution in Hong Kong, but they're American dollars. Um, and this is far from the most an institution might pay for this single uh, individual journal. Uh, Harvard University in the United States pays nearly $40,000 uh, per year for access to this single journal. Uh, there are actually around 15 or 16 entire academic disciplines like chemistry and physics and agriculture where the average ISI index journal is over $1,000 for one subscription uh, for one year. It's actually gotten so bad that uh, publications like The Economist uh, have started to take notice and last year uh, the Economist actually called academic publishing, quote, a license to print money. Uh, and it turns out that the publishers of these large journals are some of the, uh, the most profitable companies in the entire world. Uh, this is a chart showing uh, where Elsevier and Springer, two of the largest publishers, where their profit margins, or you know, how much money they make at the end of the day, um, stack up against other companies. And so you can see here they're more profitable than ExxonMobil, than Google, than Apple, than Microsoft. Uh, and this data is a little bit outdated. Um, the profit margin data is from 2008. It actually turns out that Elsevier, uh, the largest academic publisher's revenue and profit margins has increased every single year since this data came out. And last year it was actually 37%. Um, and that's for all of Elsevier as a whole. Uh, Nature uh, uh, ran an article earlier this year and they estimated that the actual margin for the scientific publishing part of Elsevier was actually about 40 to 50%. So they're basically sucking almost half of every dollar um, that the research community is putting into these journals. Um, and so I think that begs the question, is there, is there any reason that publishing should be this expensive? There's something about academic publishing that makes it so expensive. Um, and I think you know, the answer is no. Like Wikipedia, all the contributions to academic journals are for free. Right? Authors aren't paid when they publish in these academic journals. And like Wikipedia, uh, researchers do peer review for free as well. Um, a lot of times, some, some editors get a, a small amount of money um, from journals, but it's, it's very little. Um, but then, even though the researchers have sort of donated all this work, the journal publishers can essentially charge whatever the price they want because institutions like libraries have to have access. And so that gives them tremendous power to charge really whatever they want. So not only is most of this work actually, not only is all of this work done for free and reviewed for free, uh, but in fact, about 80% of all research that's done is actually publicly funded. So this is research that we've paid for as the public through our taxes, um, and the authors have contributed to these journals for free, yet we can't read the results without paying tremendous, tremendous amounts of money uh, for access. And so the solution that we're gonna talk about uh, at this panel is what we call open access. And sort of the definition is pretty simple. Uh, what open access <coughs> means is um, two things, really free, immediate, online access, to all scholarly and scientific research articles. So when you're searching for an article or find a link on Wikipedia in the reference section and you click to read it, you get immediate access. You, know, you don't hit a paywall, you know, you're not asked to pay to read a scholarly article. And then the second half is that the article comes with full reuse rights. So you can do whatever you want with the text. So for example, and I know I think Daniel's gonna talk a lot more about this point in particular, uh, but you, know, you can download and text mine these articles or you can you know, put them up on Wikipedia in their full text when you have these full reuse rights. And so it sort of enables you to do a whole suite of things that you can't do under a more restrictive license. So there are sort of two paths to getting at open access. Um, the first is what's called self-archiving. 
Uh, so authors of these journal articles can really publish in whatever journal they like, even a subscription-based journal, but they can make the actual text of the article available through a repository, like those that are hosted by libraries, or like discipline-specific repositories like PubMed Central uh, or the Archive. And then the second method is uh, through open access to journals. Um, and these are journals that make all of their content immediately uh, and freely available online uh, right when they publish the article. And actually right now, uh, there are almost 10,000 open access journals, which is really incredible. Uh, just a couple of years, just uh, about four years ago, there were uh, around 4,000. Uh, and so you can see the growth is really, really tremendous. And I think about 11% of all articles published last year were published in open access journals. So that's a really good start, but we have sort of a long way to go. Um, and then as I mentioned, the second round uh, is through self-archiving and archives like PubMed Central and the archive. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have all the time I'd like to sort of explain what open access is, uh, but I do want to point people to a resource uh, online. This is a video uh, that we did with PhD Comics called Open Access Explained, and there's a link down here at the bottom, uh, bit.ly dot forward slash OA Explained, and I think it does a pretty good job of uh, explaining what open access is, sort of how it's come about and why it's important. That video is embedded in the Wikipedia article on open access. Yes, yes, Daniel's right, and I'm pretty sure Daniel is responsible for <laughs> it. Uh, so that's a super brief uh, sort of overview of the concept, and I'm happy to sort of discuss it in more detail with you on the panel uh, if you have questions and get sort of dig into the details. Um, but now I want to talk just through one example about why you should care about open access, why it's important. And I think to me, one of the most exciting stories for why open access is important and that demonstrates the power of open access is this, this kid. Uh, I th by your laughter, I think some of you might already know, uh, but this is Jack and Draka. He, uh, at 15 years old, won the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair last year. Um, and the reason he won it, I love this picture, uh, was for inventing these. Uh, and what these are are diagnostic, uh, di or a novel diagnostic uh, for pancreatic cancer. Um, and this test that Jack invented. Um, it costs three cents and takes about five minutes to run, which makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times cheaper, 400 times more selective, and 100 times, or 400 times more sensitive and 100 times more selective than the current pancreatic cancer diagnostic called ELISA that's $800 for a single test. Uh, and he did this at 15. And the way he's able to do this is because, well, two things. I guess first of all, he did all of his research on Google and Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> And so he you know, got online, started reading, and he talks about um, how he didn't even know what a pancreas was when he started his work. Uh, he had a close uh, family friend that passed from pancreatic cancer, uh, and that's sort of what drove his interest. And so he got on the internet, did like well, most, so many people do, like Google what a pancreas is, and ended up at Wikipedia, and read the you know, Wikipedia page for pancreatic cancer. Um, and in fact, uh, I was actually talking to Jack uh, this morning about uh, the fact that I was here at the Wikimedia conference. Uh, he's saying that most of the basic information for his research came from the reference section of Wikipedia. Um, and so Wikipedia really did play a central role in enabling Jack to do this. And the other sort of half of the story is that you know, Jack was actually able to get access to the articles that he needed because you know, uh, he was able to navigate his way around uh, you know, the, the journal sites and find some articles that were posted online. He used the articles that were posted um, uh, from open access journals like the Public Library of Science. Uh, and then he, I think, used some articles that were made available through governmental open access policies that I'll talk about in a second that require all the research that a government funds to be made freely available. Um, and so I think this really speaks to how powerful the, this idea is. Um, yeah, just one example. I sort of was inspired by Jack, who used carbon nanotubes in his diagnostic. And so if you're interested, like Jack, in how carbon nanotubes are applied to medicine, you know, of course, the first result you get is Wikipedia, or nearly the first result after Google Scholar. Um, and that will take you to this lovely Wikipedia page, and then you can go down to the reference section, but uh, I didn't check all of these, but I think a lot of these are actually locked behind paywalls. I just clicked on the second one and ended up at uh, the journal page for this one that would require about $31 to read just that article. Uh, and so you can see, Luckily, Jack was able to find what he needed, but other people, you know, these are all articles that might potentially not inspire someone else or another researcher that's, that's looking at this. Um, and I think this all really ties back to sort of what Jimmy talked about in his opening uh, presentation yesterday about imagining a world in which everybody has access to the sum of all, of sum of all human knowledge. And I think Jack's a perfect example of sort of what happens when that's actually the case. Um, and I think if we can make all these articles open and then, you know, 
people can actually reference them on Wikipedia and actually get the full text. You know, that would be pretty incredible. Um, so in the three minutes that I have left, I just want to start the conversation about what we can actually do together uh, to set the default to open. Um, one important thing is raising awareness. When people hit paywalls, there, you know, you can't get access. There's not sort of a pop-up that says, you know, the system is broken. There's, you know, a completely, you know, another alternative called open access. You know, that doesn't happen. People just move on. Um, and so there's one one project that some students from my organization, the Right to Research Coalition, are working on, called the Open Access Button. And what it does is, when you click on it, it gives you this nice little pop-up, um, and you enter in your information here. I filled it up for Jimmy. I don't know if you can read it in the back. Um, and then you click Open Access, please. Um, and it populates this map uh, that's meant to record every time somebody hits a paywall. Um, and you can add a little uh, sort of note about why you're trying to get access. Um, and so this is what this prototype does now. It's actually not public yet. Um, it's still being worked on. And so you know, the first aim is to uh, you know, show how many times people hit these paywalls and are denied access. Um, so when people are hitting these paywalls, it doesn't stay an isolated event. Um, the second thing uh, that they're still working on is they're trying to build a mechanism that helps you get around the paywall. That looks for articles that are, are versions of the article that are freely posted. So when you click the button, they can point you uh, to a place where it is freely available. Uh, so this is just a prototype, but I think it's a fantastic um, idea to raise awareness. And I'd love to work with you all uh, if, to, to sort of raise awareness in your own communities and at your own institutions. And if you're interested, you can tweet at them at OA button or talk to me afterwards. Then the very last thing uh, I want to mention is there's a tremendous opportunity to make open access sort of the default for publishing um, through national and international open access policies. As I mentioned, 80% of all research is publicly funded. And so uh, one particularly effective sort of path to open access is getting governments to require that the research they fund be made freely available. Um, and so uh, right now, um, there are Eight research funders and about, or 81, excuse me, 81 research funders in about 15 countries uh, that are on the map here um, that have open access policies. So this is a great start, but you can see there's clearly a lot of work to be done. And the country is highlighted only if there's at least one research funder. So for a lot of these, there is only one research funder. There, you know, out of you know dozens that exist. Um, you know, but this is one particular sort of method uh, for making open access a reality. Uh, and there have been some really exciting developments in the US and Canada and the UK around these policies that I hope we can talk about in the discussion. Uh, the other, other part of open access policies are institutional open access policies. So these are policies like in, uh, institutions like Phoebe's, uh, the University of California, that require all the articles that are published at an institution to be made freely available. Um, and so right now there are about 177 institutions with these policies uh, in about 34 countries. And so the countries highlighted are those that have at least one institution with an open access policy. So this is another place where you all can really make a difference by reaching out to the institutions where you're housed or those around you uh, and sort of working with them to try to create these institutional open access policies. And in the discussion, I'm sort of happy to go into more details about how the policies work, you know, how they should be set up and answer any of your questions there. And then just at the last thing I would mention is that we're really excited that the Wikimedia Foundation has joined uh, the Open Access Working Group, which is a coalition of organizations uh, that advocate for uh, governmental open access policies. So we're really, really excited with sort of working with Wikipedia HQ uh, on this issue. And, but we're also really excited about working with each of you all in your sort of home countries uh, at more of a grassroots level uh, versus this. But uh, I hope you have lots of questions and this is my contact information. Um, if any of you want to follow up, I'd love to hear from any and all of you. Okay, um, thanks for coming. And now uh, we will talk about uh, what we can do, you know, as, as Wikipedians, as Wikimedians. Daniel afterwards will uh, um, 
talk about how you know uh, we can reuse open access in uh, in Wikipedia, but. Uh, as you probably know, there are several other projects in the Wikimedia family, and Wikisource is one of them. Wikisource, uh, I, I al always start with uh, this quote from uh, a very great short story, The Library of Babel, and I do because I like it and, and just want to, to set the mood for, for, for the rest of, of the talk. But uh, I really believe that, we, that Wikisource can, can be an um, enormous uh, huge digital library of connected texts. This is uh, another quote from uh, Ranganathan, who was an uh, Indian librarian, and he wrote five laws for library science. And this is the one uh, I, I really love. The library is a growing organism. And I think it really applies to Wikipedia and the Wikimedia world. We actually you know, are part of, of this organism that grows. And the third and last quote is, uh, can you imagine that there was a time when the books in a library didn't talk to each other? Uh, this is a very fun quote from uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, which uh, is uh, an inventor of artificial intelligence. And uh, I think it, you know, it's a very, very great you know, hope like, you know, to make books talk to each other, to have interconnected books, to have knowledge that come out to different books. So, what is Wikisource? Wikisource is a wiki digital library of free text. Right now, we focus mainly on paper books. Like, we want these book, books to be free, so we want them to be in the public domain. So, there are no rights. Uh, this means that they are often ancient books, you know, very old, old ones. But, uh, you know, we can actually have CC license texts on Wikisource, like, uh, literature with uh, CC by license and of course you know like open access literature is, is, all, uh, is um, all CC license so we can actually work with that um, why should we you know reuse uh, the open access literature that is out there I think that first we have integration with Wikimedia projects we say that that uh, you know the library is a growing organism, and that is a good metaphor also for Wikipedia. An organism is is an integrated system. So uh, we have a w different projects, but all they communicate with each other. We have tools, we have uh, systems for for the content of the uh, of these uh, projects to communicate. So for example, we have images in Commons, and we transclude them in Wikipedia and Wikisource. So uh, you actually, if we have, if you put some content inside a Wikimedia project, it's, act it's actually much more easier to, you know, spread this content in other projects. Uh, hyperlinking, this is what I, uh, I think, you know, uh, Minsky was talking about. We, as in Wikipedia, we uh, have Wikilinks that, you know, takes us, uh, in different pages, like mm, exploring different concepts, we can do the same things in books. We can explore different concepts. We can go from Wikisource to Wikipedia. We can go from Wikisource to another author, to another book. We can actually dig into books and uh, uh, follow all the citations and the quotes that the writer uh, wrote for us. We can have annotation, especially in some Wikisources, and uh, there is always the ongoing uh, and the perennial problem of digital preservation. Wikimedia projects are out there, there is a, a lot of work to, to preserve this content. So uh, it, it is a good idea to, you know, to also think about this thing. Um, and the one I really love is that we have a community, like Wikisource as Wikipedia as Commons are um, project done and maintained and managed and cared by and created by the community. And community means innovation, means that people actually do the stuff. It's not just algorithm, it's, just, it's not just robots, it's people. So uh, when we have people, you know, anything can happen. What we can put in Wikisource? We can put books, uh, I'll maybe show you later. Um, uh, for example, um, let's see, if this works. Um, I was in a conference. Uh, um, I was in a conference. Thanks. Um, this um, was June. 
we were uh, in a conference, uh, uh, the, the, we met an uh, uh, open access publisher that published monographies, and they said, yeah, our books are on CC license and CC BY. So we took actually a book and we uh, <coughs> put on Wikisource, and you can actually, you know, now navigate through the book. The book is on Wikisource, <coughs> you can go and uh, see the picture. The pictures are, are in commons, and uh, you know, you can, you can just go through this and uh, and see and uh, we can actually annotate it you can go and uh, link the concept to wikipedia concept to wikipedia pages you know you can do a, a, lot, a lot of things we have uh, we can put your dissertation uh, for example if you are graduate students or if you are phd students you can put your dissertation inside. I put mine, you can see it later. I will uh, send you the slides. And we can put journal articles. Uh, it, we, um, we, met, uh, we met a, a researcher in a, this very conference in Wikimania, and he is actually working on a, a LaTeX extension for MediaWiki. It needs a bit of work and care and love, but uh, we could uh, eventually implement uh, this extension in Wikisource and have journal articles in LaTeX there. So, uh, finally, what do Wikisource need? Uh, Wikisource mainly needs software development. Uh, it can reach its, its goals if, if it has some people, you know, some developers who can go there and and you know, try to create tools and uh, ease uh, things for users. It needs software development, really. I, I can <laughs> say that more. We do not have developers. And I am speaking with two board members here. But we do not have developers. Like, we really need you know, few people, but things can really scare. And we need care. As every Wikipedia, Wikimedia project, we need dedicated people who love the project, who care about books, who care about text, who care about open access, and just go and do what they want. So what can you do? You can engage with the community, you can go in the Wikisource in your, um, in your language. I think there is also a Kazakh Wikisource out there. Uh, you can, for example, upload your dissertation, try to see um, if uh, it's working, like put it out there and uh, you know, reference all your uh, your quotes, and um, if you can code, you can email me. And you can find funds for a developer. You can email me as well. You can actually, you know, uh, decide that together uh, which are the priorities. We can find projects. We can write them, and then we can find funds for you know, do stuff. So these are my contacts. So feel free to talk to me. Thank you. Very cool. Um, next up is Lane, Lane Raspberry. How do you do? My name is Lane Raspberry. I'm a user of Blue Raspberry on Wikipedia. Yes. <laughs> So Nick was telling you about some of the cultural institutions that have uh, shaped open access. He was also talking about some of the financial constraints that have decided what open access, how open access plays out in society. Uh, Andrea was talking about some of the technical, technical implementations of open access, various tools that you can use to share articles, enhance it, uh, share the work that you have. He also said what kinds of things might be shared in open access, uh, academic journal articles, dissertations. I'm going to share with you uh, an example of how open access affects typical communities, everyday people. <laughs> open access isn't just something that affects the academic community. Uh, we're talking about academic journals, research papers, but this isn't just about scientists, professors at universities. It's, uh, open access is actually an issue that affects us all. My personal interest is in health education. And what I'm going to say today is that if more scientific information, research articles, research in general, are available according to the principles of open access, then everybody uh, would be better off. 
So, and as has been said before, but let me say again, open access is the right to access and reuse scholarly academic publications, such as academic journals. One often sees this logo. Uh, I believe it was created by an organization called PLOS, Public Library of Science. It's not an official logo, but it's, it's one that we like to use to represent the concept of open access. Uh, when I talk about uh, medicine and health uh, and open access and how open access uh, affects health, I'm beginning with some premises. And I, I can't really defend these premises. I hope that uh, when I say the things that I'm going to say, you'll just accept these things with me. But just so that you'll know where I'm coming from, I, I'd like to review some things. So at different times in people's lives, sometimes along with their doctors or healthcare providers, people make a healthcare decision. The doctor will say that you, you have this uh, health decision to make in your life. They're going to make a recommendation to you and perhaps they'll also give you a choice. Or perhaps even outside the context of what a person might do with their doctor. They'll make a healthcare decision of some kind. And what I would like to tell to you is that there's such a thing as public health education. Governments of different countries give health information to the people in hopes that people will make good healthcare decisions. And so I, I believe that uh, access to health information guides the decisions that people make about their health in all kinds of ways. Uh, something else I believe is that when people have access to better health education, uh, when people have access to better health education, uh, they'll make better health decisions and thus their health will actually be better because they're making more informed, uh, better decisions. It's a bit of a leap, but I'm also going to say that people have a right to have good health throughout their life, and because they have a right to good health, they have a right to the information that would let them make the decisions that would lead them to good health. So uh, because, of the, because of these things, I, I, I say that open access is a human right, because people have a right to human health, open access, uh, people have a right to good health, open access leads to good health, so people have a right to open access. I know this, this slide is a bit crowded, uh, but please, please excuse me, you, it's not necessary that you read any of these, these things, but I just wanted to take you on a tour of a, a typical health campaign. So starting at the, the bottom of this picture, and please, just don't mind the words on this at all, I'm just, just going to tell you what's here. So this is, a, this is a citation to a publication. It happens to be written by uh, a department of, it's a, it's a paper by a department of health of a particular jurisdiction in the United States. Uh, there's a list of scientists' names who have authored a paper, and they've written a paper that has a recommendation about best practices for uh, pregnancy, what, what a mother should expect to do when she's carrying her baby. And in this paper, they make a recommendation, they state a problem, and then they make a recommendation. The problem is, in some circumstances, mothers who don't need the procedure while they're pregnant choose against their doctor's advice and against the consensus uh, of, of medical advice, they'll choose to have a procedure called a cesarean section before they've carried their baby to term. So it's natural and right and healthy, and ev every doctor agrees that when a woman is pregnant, if there's no reason not to do so, then she should carry her baby for 39 weeks in, 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 and give birth naturally. But for different reasons, because of different societal pressures, some women, and in fact a lot of women in some countries, they'll have a cesarean section where their belly is cut and the baby is removed from their belly by a doctor and it happens before she's carried the baby to full term. When this happens, it's likely that the baby will have some health problems at some point in his life. And it's not best that this happens, but somehow people have the idea in some places that this is okay. So as part of a, pu a public health campaign, uh, there's organizations which get the message out that women should carry their baby to full term. So this is just an example of one health problem where people make a decision uh, that affects their health. So as an example, uh, this information is coming from something called the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. These are medical specialists in the United States who guide doctors in uh, helping, helping women who are, who are pregnant. So they have, they have something to say. They go to a larger health organization. In this case, it, it just happens to be something called the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, ADIM Foundation, actually. And they get a second opinion about whether this is a good message to spread. 
If they decide that it's a good message to spread, then they partner with a media organization. I happen to work for this other media organization called Consumer Reports that gets health messages from medical societies and tries to disseminate them in public. And altogether, this is part of a health campaign called Choosing Wisely. In this campaign, we've got about 250 of these messages, each one sentence backed by uh, uh, citations to academic literature. Now, the problem with this campaign is that I've got one citation to do this. It happens to be, this one happens to be free. It wasn't published in an academic journal because there were some problems uh, getting access to any subscription journal. So I'm citing something that's good enough, but it's not really what I would prefer to be citing. This paper itself is citing other papers that are behind paywalls. The latest medical literature that I would prefer to be citing when I share these things is often behind subscription or otherwise not accessible to me and not accessible to other people. So uh, why, why should Wikipedians care about any health cam campaign like this? What does this mean for Wikipedians? Well, what I would tell all of you is that People are getting health information from Wikipedia. And it's not ideal that this should happen. I would prefer that people would get their health information from their doctor. But it's just a matter of fact that increasingly, people are seeking health information from the internet. When a doctor mentions a disease or a health condition or a medical procedure, sometimes people go home and they'll type in terms into, the, into their favorite search engine, perhaps Google. And as it happens, when you type in the name of a disease or a medical condition or procedure into Google, Google says that you should get your information from Wikipedia. And because of this, I think that Wikipedians should be very concerned about the quality of health information that's on Wikipedia. So I'd like to, I, I, I'm not going to go into detail, I'm just going to tell you that Wikipedia is an extremely popular source of health information. I've, I've got a bit of data, you could ask me about it later, but Here's a chart, there's some bars on the chart. The big bar is how many people are going to Wikipedia. The little bars are how many people are going to other websites. So data there. Uh, more absolutely, there's uh, some absolute data of, about how many people are going to the Wikipedia article on the cesarean section. It says that there's 90,000 views per month. This is, uh, this is in about the top, uh, top tenth of a percent of Wikipedia articles by popularity. It's well with the, it's one of the most popular articles on Wikipedia, the article on cesarean section. And many people don't realize just how popular health articles are on Wikipedia. They're extremely popular. <laughs> I make the assertion that Wikipedia is the world's most popular, the most consulted source of health information. I, I think we have a, a burden of responsibility on Wikipedia to make sure that there's good information there. Uh, so just some takeaway points. I, I want you to remember that people who seek information about health on the internet, they're, they're getting information on the, uh, from Wikipedia. So again, it's best to get inf health information from your doctor or healthcare provider, but just because people are getting health information from the internet, I think that puts some responsibility on Wikipedians. I feel that Wikipedians are best able to contribute to Wikipedia when they have access to scholarly and academic literature. Scholarly and academic literature goes into the general public and community through Wikipedia, and if Wikipedians have open access, then they can improve the quality of Wikipedia articles. There's a lot of organizations that would like to be sharing health messages on Wikipedia, including governments, research foundations, uh, all, all kinds of scholarly organizations, and I think that they would appreciate uh, hearing that the public actually wants access to these things, and they, they need to come to realize that if content isn't open access, then it really does hurt communities. Uh, thank you very much for coming here, and uh, I'll be around to answer questions at the end. Switching over, it's been a fairly long session already. If you need to stretch your arms or stretch your legs, now's the time to do that. Stand up and dance. Or... <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so some of you are stretching. That's good. Um, it, 
with a panel of this many uh, individuals, it's always difficult determining the exact right order. So uh, there will be a little bit of repeating uh, of what my pr uh, previous uh, panelists have talked about. But I think that's really helpful because we can reinforce some of the points. Uh, so Lane uh, finished by saying uh, the importance of, of uh, in, uh, being able to cite academic sources, particularly uh, what they're in open access and the, and the way it would improve, improve health information. But I also want to add a little bit of a cautionary note with regard to the sources themselves. Uh, and so what Nick talked about in terms of the ridiculous pricing structures of academic journal is really one of the symptoms of the dysfunction of the academic publishing industry and the academic publishing system. Uh, and yes, yesterday and today I've been to a number of sessions and a number of Wikipedian researchers have looked at the community of Wikipedians and how there are so many rules and regulations that springing up and there are disputes and so forth and some of the people are complaining about having too many rules and disciplines and people being excluded uh, and so on and so forth. And I had heard that and I thought, oh, well that sounds exactly like the academic uh, community too, because the academia, that's exactly what's been going on uh, for a much longer time. With a lot of arguments, a lot of rules, and uh, who get to write about what and who get to publish where. And these rules are in fact much, much, much harder to break than uh, those in Wikipedia. At least you have uh, places to publicly argue about it, but in academia, uh, those are much closer in terms of who gets to say what and so forth. And that, to a large extent, drives some of the kind of peculiarities that you see in terms of the pricing and so forth, which I'll come back to. My particular interest is how these kind of dysfunctional system in academic publishing affects no, not only how knowledge is distributed, but particularly of how we're getting a very distorted sense of the world's knowledge. Uh, and Wikipedia wants to be represent representing the sum of all human knowledge, but I would say that right now we're getting uh, representation very unevenly, and, and this is well acknowledged within the Wikimedia community, but less so in the academic community. And again, the dysfunctional nature of academic publishing has contributed to highly unequal representations of ideas and knowledge from around the world. And this is what I've been interested in, and in asking the question as to what, whether open access as, a, as an idea and as a practice could even out this kind of very unequal distribution of global knowledge. Now, Nick show you some of the statistics and stuff, and this is a, a representation of the number of uh, uh, academic journals that are being published by different parts of, uh, by different countries. And the one at the bottom there, there's much longer, a, a bigger bar than anywhere else is uh, not surprisingly United States. So United States published most number of, of uh, academic journals and then down the rank and of course and the, the rest of the world do publish as well as you'll see, uh, but they're certainly uh, smaller in, uh, in, po in terms of total proportion of the journals that they publish. Here's a world as we know it, uh, in, in terms of geographic size. Uh, here's a world uh, as, we, as being represented uh, by a system called the Thomson uh, Impact Factor, the Citation uh, uh, Index. Uh, so what this represents is uh, scholarly articles uh, that are being indexed by this um, journal Impact Factors database uh, and the, the larger the number of articles that are being indexed, uh, they will show up in this catagraph, catagraph uh, this will push a larger uh, relative to the geographic size. And you can see that US, there, the big purple one, is uh, bloated rather fat uh, relative to its actual size because there are way more papers from the US that are being indexed by the Thomson impact factor than uh, other parts of the world. Uh, the, the, the middle part, uh, Parties here. This is the United Kingdom, and this is the U.S., Germany, France. The fairly well represented, the EU countries. And this whole strip here, <laughs> this, a colleague of mine described as a little pencil, is the whole entire continent of Africa. And if it's not for the fact that South Africa has some input there being indexed by Thomson ISI, the whole continent would have been invisible. Uh, I don't know where Kazakhstan stands in here, but I bet you Kazakhstan is not well represented in this map as well. But does it mean that countries like Kazakhstan, 
uh, or Zimbabwe or Uganda are not producing uh, important academic knowledge. Uh, in fact, they are. They are all producing important academic uh, um, uh, information and publishing books and journals. It's just that according to this system of recognition, this ISI, this international system of recognition, they're not being recognized as being legitimate knowledge that is worth indexing, as worth the quality uh, that the other, uh, uh, that, that the library should be paying attention to. Um, so this is the journal impact factor owned by a company uh, called Thomson Reuters. But many of you know it also owns uh, a lot of other information uh, um, a, a company around the world. In fact, Thomson bought the, the news agency Reuters about five years ago and became the world's largest information brokers. Uh, but they also own this uh, ISI index. Uh, and they calculate the impact, impact factors of all the journals but the data is, and, uh, are not available to the journals themselves. The formula is very easy. Calculate the number of citations, uh, average number of citations uh, 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 in a particular journal over a two-year period, but they don't tell you exactly what the denominator and the, and the, uh, and the numbers that they use to calculate those uh, figures. Uh, and so you are really at the mercy of this private company to determine the ranking uh, of the journals. And, uh, and this become a system that a lot of academics live by. Now, you would ask, you know, when, when Nick talked about the, the crazy prices of these journals, why would academics be willing to continue to support this system? And the reality is within academics, and those of you who work in academic institutions know very well, we live by this rule called publish or perish. That is, we have to continue to publish, not only publish, but publish in so-called uh, high impact journals, uh, high reputation journals, in order for us to get promoted, to get grant fundings and so forth. So we're quite willing to continue to support a system that we know is quite dysfunctional in order to get our promotion and recognition. So I think one of the upshot of understanding this whole change of the dynamic of open access is that we have this, at the same time challenged this whole academic reward system. And it's something that I think we could talk about later. Uh, and I think this is important to, to look at. I have more graphics, but this, this make, these make the same point. I don't think the, 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 the numbers are too small for you to see. On the left-hand side is the journals coming from the US that has the high impact factors. Yeah, again, very disproportionate compared to the rest of the world. And this is the, the publishers uh, uh, that are dominating the publishing industry. Again, the, the, the letters are too small, but the, the, the same company that Nick talked about on the left-hand side, Elsevier on the top left there, uh, dominates science publishing. They mo own most of the scientific publishing, uh, both in the science and the uh, social sciences around the world. And Nick talked about these uh, profit margin too, just to, again, to show you a slightly different perspective on it. Uh, we, we tend to uh, criticize the mining industry as being highly extractive, but these publishing industries are actually even more extractive in terms of taking public goods and then privatizing it and then uh, getting an amount, immense amount of profit out of it. Uh, I want to tell you quickly a story why this is important to, to, to us. This is a colleague of mine who works at the Jumbo Kenyatta University in Kenya, and for 20 years she's been studying African native vegetables. Now, uh, Mary's been studying uh, these native vegetables because these are vegetables that she grew up with, that her grandfather used to cultivate, used to eat. These are vegetables that grow well in the native condition in East Africa. They're drought resistant, they're highly nutritious, uh, and they can make all kinds of good food uh, from it. Uh, but over the years, people have been neglecting these vegetables in favor of imported vegetables. And she's trying to reintroduce this vegetable back to the farmer and to the market as a sustainable food source. So as she published these, she tried to put them in academic journals in the West. And one reviewer wrote back in the uh, uh, review that says, sorry, we can't publish your paper because you study weeds. We only publish paper on vegetables. And uh, the, the, uh, the point is that the reviewers simply do not accept the fact that these are uh, uh, vegetables that you can eat, and so for that journal, it's simply not regarded as an appropriate uh, submission. Now, 
uh, about 20 years ago, in fact, exactly 20 years ago, some of my colleagues started this initiative called BioLine International. And that's the early day of the World Wide Web. And the idea my colleagues had was to say, well, we have all these journals from around the world, particularly from Sub-Saharan Africa. Why don't we start putting our own academic resources and journals onto the internet, onto the web, and see what happened? And so began a very, very early uh, open access initiative. Uh, and on this uh, website that now I coordinate, uh, we have a number of journals that are open access and publishing um, materials from, from different parts of the developing world and from East Africa. So Mary's paper has been published in this uh, long-running journals uh, in uh, uh, African, African crop science. Uh, and through, through her publication in, in these journals, uh, we are seeing her work being picked up by other young researchers who are interested in uh, native vegetables. And now, uh, in East Africa, we see a very vibrant communities of uh, researchers working on indigenous crops and vegetables. So the, 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 the question we're really wanting to answer is, does this kind of open access uh, facilitate a much better kind of South-South collaboration and dialogue instead of the more traditional way where the information and knowledge are, are being exported from the north to the south as if all the valuable information are coming from the north. So, so to us, open access is a, really an enabler in terms of participation and knowledge inclusion. And again, the, the ethos of this is, is highly, highly um, um, relevant with Wikipedia, obviously. I have a whole lot of research questions. These are the work that I do with my colleagues and students looking at different aspects of of open access, uh, and um, I, I won't obviously won't time to go through it. But if I have one more minute, I will give you one more example. So uh, Lane gave you some examples that are fairly conditions that are fairly common around the world, right? Disease uh, conditions that affect pregnant women and so forth. Uh, I I went to Wikipedia and look at uh, this uh, problem called uh, commonly called the sleeping sickness. And this is a condition that is um, transmitted by uh, a fly called the titsi fly, fly that is only um, present in sub-Saharan Africa. And this, uh, this disease, therefore, only affects a, a limited number of people, but significant number of people in sub-Saharan Africa, but certainly not a disease that affects people uh, in, in, the, in the rest of the world, particularly in the rich countries. Uh, when I went through this article, I was interested in the references, and there are a fair number of references, like, there are about 40 of them. Uh, and when I went through the reference uh, a little bit carefully, I just, I don't know if you can see the highlight. There's a particular journal called The Lancet, which is one of the most highly regarded medical journals uh, around the world. Uh, but Lancet, when you try to click on the link, there are, there are links to, some of them, to the PubMed uh, ID, and you can get the abstract. But uh, in order for you to read the full text, you would have to go to one of these uh, outlets. Uh, unless, you, again, you belong to a university that subscribes to these journal articles. And you saw from Nick's uh, slide earlier a very similar thing. Pay $31, uh, uh, or you don't get to read the full article. Um, now, the, the, the irony of this, as, as Nick pointed out, there are over a 1,000 uh, open access journals, and there are uh, over 2,500 institutional repositories around the world. Uh, when you look at this list of them, there are only two articles that's been archived. One of them has been put on the Internet Archive. One of them has been put on uh, ArchiveX, which is the, the physics e-print archive. Uh, none of them were, have been put up, uh, are reachable from the institutional repository or uh, the open access journal. So what I'd like to see as an action item is we can begin to look through these references. And in particular diseases like uh, sleeping sickness, there are lots of sources outside. Uh, and again, I'm being biased pointing to the system that we are, we are right now running, the BioLine uh, website. There are lots of articles that talk about uh, sleeping sickness uh, in Africa. Uh, but none of them have been cited. And in fact, this uh, African Health Science Journal, the editor started this 11 years ago with the explicit intent of encouraging researchers to publish on diseases that affect uh, local population and hopefully that they will be cited. Now, these articles are in fact being cited by the other medical researchers and literature. 
But what I would love to see is the Wikimedian community begin to make use of these indigenous, uh, well, what I would say, more locally produced knowledge to supplement articles like uh, the African Sleeping Sickness. So that would be one of my wish lists, if you will. And it's not hard to do, and it's very easy to do, uh, and it's just a matter of searching for the result uh, and other sources that are not uh, you, the traditional sources that people are, uh, are go to directly. Okay. And I think Daniel will follow this very nicely with some practical suggestions. Yeah, Thanks. super. Thank you. section of Wikipedia articles, you have seen it in the previous uh, presentations here. And the question is, can we do something uh, so that the readers of Wikipedia articles don't spend their time looking on those references that they do not have access to? Or could we even incentivize Wikipedia editors uh, to kind of look through those references and uh, check uh, specifically those that are licensed in a way that they can use the images from those scholarly articles uh, to illustrate Wikipedia articles? And uh, well, this is a page that goes into a lot of detail around this. Um, so I'll go back to the definition of open access. Um, in terms of the Budapest Open Access uh, Initiative, then, uh, which basically says uh, open access means um, equivalent to Creative Commons attribution license. It's a bit more complicated. And what if I have just one sentence? I say, if you can put it on Wikipedia, then it is open access. If it is not, then it's not. Um, then uh, we have a number of icons that are being used to signal uh, the open access and that's including the one that you've seen on the previous um, talks. The problem with this one, it wasn't initially intended to basically signal uh, open access in that sense, but it has been used in a much broader sense. You can even see it on Elsevier uh, websites um, where uh, you're not to do basically uh, not allowed to do anything with that paper that has the signal other than just read it. You're not allowed to download it, you're not allowed to send it to your uh, colleagues, you're not, you're not allowed to put it on any website and so on. So it has been misused. And so uh, using this may cause uh, other problems. On the other hand, we could go and say, okay, um, we can signal the things independently. Like we could take the Creative Commons item for the CC by license. And you can say, this is a free-to-read item, which doesn't necessarily mean it's free to reuse. And then you could combine that. And then how would that look like in the context of, oh yeah, there's another, another option. You could go buy a color scheme. That kind of color scheme is actually used in some libraries. Like, red means you do not have access. You meaning from that computer that you're on. Um, green means you have access to this journal. And yellow means you may have access to some issues of the journal, but not to all of them. Of course, this is highly specific to an institution, and so uh, we don't want to play that game on Wikipedia, but basically everyone is accessible. Um, and also the color codes there. Uh, yellow would uh, be very close to gold, and the green is green. The gold and green means but something rather specific in open access context. So what could we do? Uh, there's a number of things that we could do. Oh, there's all those green buttons I've already here. Um, but you see here this orange line. 
that's the way that we could use to signal that something is an open access. We have in fact tested this template for two years now. It is a standard feature in the research newsletter. And it has been used in a number of Wikipedia articles to signal just the fact that that is free to read, basically. We could be more specific. Uh, we could choose this icon, I've just copied that. That's uh, basically the uh, famous bridge in Budapest uh, that has been used in um, in some publications about the Budapest Open Access Initiative, we could use that and give it the meaning of uh, being free to read and to reuse. Um, or you could go, yeah, that's the CC icon and that's the free to read icon. So, and the good thing is, uh, since we're often using templates to um, kind of uh, handle references, um, having the possibility to signal that could be included into a template and then put this play on basically every page immediately. Um, if there were a way to automatically determine uh, whether a particular article is open access or not. And one way to do that would be by the prefix of the DOI. Uh, there are certain publishers, well the prefix of the DOI uh, kind of identifies the publisher. It's not exactly the, uh, true because some publishers go around shopping other publishers like Nelson here is eating a lot of other smaller publishers. Uh, but basically the prefix identifies the publisher. And if the publisher only publishes uh, CC by an article, like PLOS does, uh, then we could go, okay, if, it, if an article has a DOI with this kind of prefix, we're sure this is open access and there. Uh, we can do even normal template syntax to display that uh, icon. Uh, it's a bit more complicated in real life because most publishers are not of that kind. And so also most papers uh, uh, would need a kind of per article basis of the determination of the licensing. But Crossref, the organization that handles most of those uh, DOIs, they're actually working on a system that provides the information. So they will soon have uh, per article information about licensing. Once they have that, we could in principle implement that. But whether we do this, that's a community uh, decision and I just invite you to Okay, I've tweeted a number of other links um, that could be interesting. So let me just see. Um, yeah, once we have something that is freely licensed, so licensed for the use, we could also try to automate that. Um, so, for instance, there's loads of um, images and media being used from open access articles in um, open, well, in Wikipedia articles. Uh, and they are typically, um, well, seen by some Wikipedia editors in some scholarly journal articles. And then they say, oh, that's a nice illustration. I want to use that in this and that Wikipedia article. So they download it from the journal article, maybe even crop it or convert it somehow. And then they upload it to Wikipedia Commons, then they embed it from Commons into Wikipedia. It's a lot of work, a lot of tedious work that could be automated. And so here is a, uh, one way how this could be uh, automated. In fact, this is a bot that spiders a large scholarly database called Comet Central for articles that are licensed CC BY and that do have video and audio uh, material, or audio, uh, video or audio. And if it finds these, then it just downloads them and puts them up on Commons so that you can uh, input them into Wikipedia articles. So far it has done 13,000, that's one third of the videos on Commons. And so um, we now have a strange situation that uh, uh, we have for certain kind of media, namely videos, more science than uh, what would be proportional on Wikipedia articles. Because normally science is a very, very small proportion uh, in most of the wiki. Uh, media projects, but on Commons in terms of video, it's really strong. So if you want to start writing Wikipedia articles uh, about uh, scientific topics, you have a lot of video to work with. And especially the kind of Wikipedia, they have a very, uh, oh yeah, you're waking up. Um, <laughs> they, they have a very uh, bizarre arrangement in, uh, as compared to other Wikipedias because they were very successful <coughs> in getting text from an ancient, more or less ancient, uh, because it's older than many of the students here. Um, encyclopedia. Um, it, uh, I think that's actually a clever approach. If you have a large corpus of text in your language and it is reasonably up to date, then it is a good place to start. Uh, putting it up on Wikipedia requires a free license. They've succeeded with that. And then uh, you can form a community. Part of the community is here. 
The problem is then uh, how to bring the newest stuff onto that. And uh, most of the illustrations in the former Kazakh encyclopedia, they were really uh, poor by today's standards. Um, but now we have loads of video, and many of those articles on the Kazakh Wikipedia do not have any image, even though they exist. So I would encourage you to think about how you could put the, this kind of material into your articles. I have another um, link that I've tweeted. Um, here we go. Yeah, that's, I've mentioned this in other sessions. Uh, there is an, a traveling ex exhibition in Germany every year. Next year it will be about the digital society. And the digital society, of course, includes Wikipedia uh, and open access. And if you have any ideas on how we could represent that in, a in a, an exhibition that travels with that ship there through Germany and Austria, please come to me and talk about it. Then, um, we are not just talking open access and uh, Wikimedia in general terms here. We're also talking about it in very practical terms, like there is a wiki project open access. Here we go. It's currently located on the English Wikipedia, but we're thinking about broadening it. We're very open to having people from other uh, Wikimedia projects participate. And uh, yeah, here's a news feed uh, that, that you can see. There's also a feature open access file of the day. So we post one file every day. Uh, you can see the latest three ones. The conditions here are they have to come from an open access uh, source uh, and they have to be used in at least three wiki pages outside user space, somewhere in uh, Wikimedia project. And we have no problems actually finding those because there are more than a thousand such uh, files so far that have been used at least three times across Wikimedia projects and come from open access sources. And yeah, we also work on statistics, like how often are um, open access files or uh, files for open access actually being used. So I'll just show you uh, some examples of that. Uh, I actually take a website because the service uh, seems to be a little overloaded. So you have basic statistics. Uh, a few days ago, the uh, category open access, oh, here we go, category open access publishing on Commons at roughly 20,000 images. Of these, uh, you scroll down then, you see uh, that they're used uh, in roughly 50,000 times altogether. Here we go. Yeah, they're, they are used 50,000 times altogether, and that, but only 5,000 of those 20,000 files have been used yet. So uh, there's a lot of uh, more room to actually use those files. But the thing is, um, when I started my Wikimedia Residence project, we had altogether about 2,000 files from open access sources on Commons. So now uh, we have more than 5,000 that are actually being used, and more 20,000 uh, that are on Commons in general. So there's a lot uh, of materials to play with, and I would encourage you to play with it in terms of putting it into Wikibooks, Wikisource, whatever, where you find it useful. And I hope now we will have some more uh, place for discussion. If you want to engage with Wiki Project Open Access, that's also the right place to signal your interest. Yeah, super. So thank you, Daniel. <laughs> Maybe we can change this. Uh, yeah, it's super. Yeah, so um, I'll just ask folks to come up. And. It's okay. Yeah, just leave it. Um, are there any questions? Are there any questions from the audience? Melissa, I feel like you should be up here too. <laughs> if there are any questions. Um, we have the convener of the meeting that actually coined the term open access yeah. in the audience. Yeah. 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 I could generalize all your presentations, 
trying to motivate the academics to contribute into and see uh, into the Wikipedia, if that is correct for us. Oh, maybe not with Daniel's okay, yeah. <laughs> But um, what is your thoughts about how is the Wikipedia benefiting the academic or the academic world? So I'll just repeat the question so everyone can hear. Um, all these presentations were about um, academics contributing to Wikipedia, and how can Wikipedia uh, impact the academic world or contribute to the academic world? Is that right? Okay. I think one really interesting area of research would be uh, to see how articles that are referenced on Wikipedia, particularly on high traffic pages, how that affects their citation rates and download count. Uh, when I was actually Putting together my presentation, I noticed that one of the articles that I used uh, was actually like one of the top 25 most cited articles in that paper for some period of time. And I have, you know, sort of a sneaking suspicion um, that there might be some some sort of uh, correlation there. I don't have the skills that some of you in the audience and our panel possess to really look into that rigorously, but I think uh, there might be a real real effect there, a real benefit to researchers in having their articles cited. So I mentioned the journal impact factor, which is a traditional citation metric in academic journals. And in social sciences, where I belong, most of the journals are, have an impact factor of one or lower. That means an average article cite once in their lifetime. 80% of the articles have never been cited. And if you've been cited uh, three times, you're, you're more than average. So, uh, so, so one of the incentives for academic, obviously, is to have the work read by the public and being being uh, understood by the public. And so one of the things I would love to see is a metrics that take into account citation in Wikipedia and in terms of public outreach, in terms of different kind of impact instead of just very traditional citation impact. So if someone can write some APIs that also tracks uh, Wikipedia impact, um, Wikipedia citation, that would be great. Uh, there's a project called Total, Total Impact that is beginning to do that. It's called Research Story Hub. They changed the name. <laughs> oh, impacts, in, impact, or impact story. Impact story. Yeah. Impact story. Sorry. <laughs> Daniel. Yeah, I have basically a number of comments. There is not just impact story. The Wikipedia uh, data that comes out of the impact story is actually buggy at the moment. Yeah. There is uh, also plots that are developing their own uh, system of tracking Wikipedia citations of a certain paper, and uh, well, to get, together with Dario, I've hacked uh, together a, a, some other prototype that basically counts across publishers, like basically takes the first part of the UI and then tells how often is a certain publisher being cited on Wikipedia. And this gives us information um, on, on the publisher level. We see that, for instance, in the Vietnamese Wikipedia, PLOS is cited more than Elsevier, uh, even though there is uh, way fewer articles on in PLOS journals than in Elsevier, if you take all together. And so we already see the impact of open access in such a environment. Who yeah. here, just out of curiosity, I want to make sure that we're not losing anyone. Who here is familiar with PLOS or knows what we're talking about when we're saying PLOS? Like, no. Decent coverage. It's a yeah. very large open access publisher that's not profit. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, I think the academics could do is uh, write less paper and contribute more to Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Right incentive structure that right? yeah yeah I mean, I mean like there is it's a huge problem uh, it's a problem of uh, how scholarship works how uh, tenure works how you, you you make your career it's it's very it's very uh, difficult it's a problem of of complexity of uh, uh, of tracking authorship like if I'm as an academic contribute heavily to Wikipedia how can I you know report this to you know a fund committee and say okay I've done this but it, it's, it's a very huge problem uh, a easier thing that we can do now uh, is that uh, academics could ask their graduates not to write a dissertation but to contribute to Wikipedia to make you know projects because uh, I, I work in a university I see thousands of you know so and so thesis because you know when you have a bachelor you are not a researcher so you know it's actually good for you to make th that little research but it's about you it's not about it no one will read your thesis no one is just you just take it and you put it somewhere 
Uh, and so uh, that benefits you as a, a, a graduate student because you, you, you learn to write uh, scientifically. So, but you can do that, you know, for uh, uh, with in a more useful way. You can you can actually exploit your time and dedication in a project that actually you know impacts on people. And I think that this this concept that is is not mine is a uh, Shirky uh, cognitive surplus can be hugely. Uh, uh, used in universities, like just think about how many students make their dissertation and put them on Wikipedia, like it will explode. Yeah, that's great. That's super. Um, so I think we've got three, I just got five <laughs> questions, six questions lined up, but first uh, you and then Dario and then uh, Timu and then we'll go from there. Um, we don't have a ton of time left for questions, unfortunately, because we had so much to cover in all those great presentations, but I suspect that we're all happy to discuss this at the break as well. So, uh, yes, uh, we're talking a lot about uh, convincing institutions and scientists to join the Open Access Initiative. Would there be something uh, we could push for on the legislative side to help open access? Would you have a policy wish list? Okay, yes. is there a policy wish list? <laughs> So ab absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, since we only had I think ten minutes to do an introduction to the entire topic, uh, we didn't, weren't able to uh, sort of delve into that in as much detail. But there is a huge amount of you know, uh, at the legislative level or at the policy making level in all of your countries. Uh, as I mentioned, only fourteen countries, or at least one research funder, has a policy. So the good news is that there are fourteen countries that have models already. You know, so there are institutions in the UK and Canada and Australia and Europe and the US that have policies that you can serve you know, the service model. Uh, but we have all the other countries that still need them. Um, and so we would love to work with you and your communities to make this an issue uh, you know, back home and start conversations with your policy making bodies. And we have sort of resources to help you. We have sort of templates and can point you towards other things just sort of come talk to us or email me or I'll just say, um, if I can interrupt, I think, can you turn the mic back on? Um, Melissa, can you stand up for a moment? Uh, thank you. If you're interested in this topic, please talk to yeah, Melissa Hagman, who's one of the world experts on policy and open access. So we have a lot of interest in that topic, and I think the answer is yes. <laughs> right? So, Dario? Yeah. Dario yeah. uh, Harrelly from Wikipedia Foundation. Uh, first, we comment uh, follow up on the, uh, the idea of, uh, well, can we measure what we have there? Sources for open access. The team at MIT could actually plan to run a control test to select a topic on Wikipedia, which uh, split the focus of the research topics into like two groups uh, and add open access resources to how to make it. Sort of over the years, how that would affect the impact of the furniture itself and also cycle uh, adoption of those topics and those methods. So, right, there's some issues. Great, great. Other uh, questions for the panelists. Uh, if you could name like a single uh, lowest hanging fruit that would make uh, OA uh, equal. So, going back to your question. Okay, just for the audience, uh, he asked what the um, lowest hanging fruit would be for to make OA equal for everyone. So I think my understanding is that there's one thing we could do to sort of flip the entire system. What could be? Is that right? <coughs> well, okay. Well, I guess for me, um, I think the single largest thing is to target research funders. As I said, 80% is the vast majority of research is publicly funded, and funded by our governments with our dollars. And so, if we can just get the governments to require that all of the research that they fund to be made openly available, that gets us 80%. Uh, of the way there, and it's just good public policy, right? Because when you make this stuff openly available, it's spread more, it's cited more, it actually has more of an impact, and that's why we're funding this research in the first place. With the caveat that in most in low income countries, uh, research are not funded by government, they're funded by other agencies, or very often international donors and agencies. So I would say a supplement to that would be to have all these other large international agencies, particularly donor agencies. Uh, to also have policy on open access. So that would even things out a bit. Just to follow up on Nick's point, um, the largest measure is the open access to date was a mandate coming out of the U.S. National Institute of Health in 2008. And um, they now um, mandate that all of the research which they fund, which amounts to $30 million annually, is made freely available online. We're lo looking to expand that to the other
Yeah, yeah it was. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood your question well, but uh, I see like low hanging fruit and default open access as opposite. Like, I mean, it's not, it's not, there is no easy way to, to get open access as a default. And I would say that the, the silver bullet is auto shift in collaborative environments, like tracking auto shift in the collaborative uh, projects, open science. And the low hanging fruit that, the, the lower hanging fruit that I see as an impact is uh, having the Wikimedia Foundation push officially, you know, the open access. Yeah, it's kind of simple. Okay, uh, Tina, you were first. Do you still have a question? Or do you want? I have a follow up to some of these yeah. questions. Since there's only a limited time to discuss things here, there is a page in open access on Meta. Ah, okay. So if you look for it, that includes links to a, a few templates now, and it'll soon include links to all the templates of the 14 countries that have them. So you can see if there's a, if there's a model that matches what you know in your own. So, SJ, what's that page? It's called open access on Meta. <laughs> So that would be meta.wikimedia.org slash wiki slash uh, open access. <laughs> um, okay, I think Timu, Mikuru, is there somebody else in here? Just a quick comment related <laughs> yes. to, to, to get the academics to write Wikipedia. I think it's a, I think many countries, I, I come from Finland, I mean, all the countries I know that where legislation define, defines the tasks of the faculty based on research teaching and their service. And the service is not very well defined. And if you can get to the university policies that they count your Wikipedia contributions as part of your service, that's okay. Yeah. In, in one university in Sweden, they're actually doing this. There's a Wikipedia in residence with the Agriculture University of Sweden, and they're actually exploiting uh, explicitly this service part of the contributions in order to get academics uh, to contribute systematically. Right, we're well, getting to work with tenure and profession. The University of Hong Kong, where the vice, or vice chancellor was in a different meeting the other day, also mentioned that the University of Hong Kong, including a big section on public outreach and services, uh, that would include that kind of thing. I should mention our host institution here, the, Holy, uh, the Hong Kong Polytechnic Institute, has an institutional open access policy. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah. I basically had a, a reply to Darius' question on what could be. As I was hanging through, and I would like to turn it from uh, to the perspective of Wikimedia. Uh, and I think actually implementing something like that OA signaling system across yeah. Wikipedia yeah. would yeah. really uh, yeah. kind of sensitize yeah. people because when they're scrolling down to the reference section, then they're seeing that this whatever icon we choose, uh, it will become more or less the standard of signaling the OA ness. And if something is, uh, a reference is there without an icon, people will get suspicious. Uh, do I really have access to it? Which kind of brings the, the issue to the mind of the people, including the researchers that deeply care about being cited. Yeah. Okay, here's what I would like to do. Because we're at time for this session, and I realize there are many interesting things going on in this conference, <coughs> including the coffee break upstairs, um, I would like to invite anyone who needs to go, needs to go to another session, needs to leave for uh, the coffee break to do so at this time. If you need to take off, that's totally fine. But I would also like to invite our panelists um, and anyone interested in the topic, including you guys who have questions, um, to stay for another five or ten minutes and we can continue the discussion. Is that sound good, Kevin? Yes. Okay, super. Um, and I'm hoping, like Will said, you can stay. Uh, uh, so, um, yes, thank you very much. Can I ask you? Okay, but if you need to go, can you please go? So we can, so we can continue to discuss. Thank you. I just asked my students to stay because my question is relevant to them. Uh, okay. Do you want, what's your question? Let's go ahead with you. I have a question. I have a spread of that uh, youth can move the world, the youth can change the world. So as you can see, the students are coming here and they're uh, inspired by this idea of opening access and working on Wikipedia. Could you say a couple of motivational words? Uh, why do you personally do these things and why they should do it? Because I think their contribution will be invaluable. 
why why we should why? contribute? I mean, I see uh, Wikipedia as one of the most altruistic activity in the world ah, today. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I I was I'm also academic. I wrote five papers and submitted as high impact factor journals, and they are charging other people. Nobody can do this actually. But attending this conference, I realized that it's something that I should where I should contribute personally. So, could you say a couple of words to students? Yeah, well, you guys are the future leader. You guys are the future scientists. You guys are the future lawmakers. And, and you guys are the future uh, innovators, right? And uh, Nick's already gave you the example of the young man, Jack Ankara, who did something amazing uh, through his own initiative. So you, this is all at your fingertips. This is entirely up to you to take advantage of it. So there's no more excuses for not you know, knowing something because you can just, you know, everything's a fingertips away from you, provided that you know what's behind the information, where they come from and so forth, many of us have talked about. So really, you need to take the initiative and, and I think so many of the new innovations over the next decade is gonna come from parts of the world that we don't think about, like Kazakhstan, uh, and it would be great, you know, read about you later and then you can cite this, rep this conference as part of your motivation. And the other thing is, like, you know, we're inheriting this system, right? It doesn't have to be the way it always has been. Uh, our, the organization that I work with, the Right to Research Coalition, uh, started four years ago from students' frustration with getting access to articles. Now we have over 71 members that represent uh, about 7 million students in over 100 countries, we're a student organization. And students are really starting to take charge and really change this system in a material way. And so you can really be part of that. And we'd love to work with, uh, work with you in getting yourselves and your students involved in this movement. It's something that students really do have power to change. Students played a significant role in getting the US White House policy put into place this year that will make all $60 billion worth of research to US government funds openly available. And we'd love to work with you in doing it in Kazakhstan and other countries as well. Practical suggestion: The article on Jack and Rebecca doesn't exist in Kazakh. And uh, just reading up about him and translating that maybe together uh, could be a very good experience uh, to kind of think about the issues that are being involved. And why did he go through open access? What did he want to do? What did he achieve as someone who's about your age? Um, and then basically, if he can do it, you can do it as your, uh, yourself. And if you tweet at him, he will tweet back to you. He's very excited that it was in Kazakh. <laughs> To motivate you all, I, I would say that I'd like for you all to believe just how influential and powerful you are at this time as compared to previous generations. I shared with you that I add health information to Wikipedia, and I also showed you that Wikipedia is a highly consulted source of health information. Whatever you add to Wikipedia, when you add information to a Wikipedia article, you're contributing to what is probably the world's most consulted source of information on that topic. So if any time in your future you have 15 or 30 minutes to add a sentence or two to Wikipedia with a citation, so many people will read what you said and you might be able to say that because of the information you added to Wikipedia, uh, you're the world's most consulted published, accessed, <laughs> and requested authority on that topic. <laughs> it, it's highly motivating when you think of it that way. Yeah, yeah and just a few words. Uh, I would like to quote, like my, my suggestion is read, read tons of books, uh, read Wikipedias, read in other languages, learn, because to quote another guy who unfortunately isn't here, but Aaron Schwartz, information is power, and so you have the power to have impact, you have the power to change things, and you have the power to change them better, so just do it. Okay. Anything else from maybe experienced people, Timu, yeah? Just came one thing into my mind which was not, not mentioned in there and relates to the health information too. I think academics uh, has a huge responsibility to write Wikipedia in their own language. Um, I feel uncomfortable. I have published all my work, like academic work, in, in, in English. So I feel that I need to write about those topics in the Finnish Wikipedia because otherwise the schools and the general public won't know about my research anything. So say with the with all the minor languages in the world. You read English and you can write your Wikipedia.
yeah, popularized the English science in the old languages. Here's my message. Wikipedia will open up the world. <laughs> <laughs> and you will bring your knowledge and the world back to Wikipedia. So. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in the end, it would be great if we could just sort of put more value on open access so that people are naturally inclined to publish and you know, make their work openly available. But there are actually hacks to the current system um, that can accomplish sort of the same goal, one of which uh, is a program, I think, at the University of Liege where you know, they still reward their researchers for publishing in high-profile journals, but the thing is, they will only look at the article from a link that's to their own institutional repository. So if you want credit for your work, no matter where it's published, you have to put a link to it in the repository in your report. So you can publish wherever, but it has to be deposited. And so that copy can then be made freely available to anyone. Um, so I think that's a particularly elegant way to get at this, this issue. But there's a circularity here sometimes. We want to look at open access journals and say, oh, publish in them because they have high impact factors, because then we still trap in that impact right. factor. But we have to play that game yeah. right now. So I we think that know. we, from looking at a lot of sort of what the internet can do and all the tools, and I would right. encourage the next generation of scholars not to think about journal articles or books as being the two sort of outcomes. Like there are many ways by which you can communicate your research and so forth. So I think open science and, and the, the digital scholarship are showing there are different kinds of scholarly representations that are valuable along the way of the whole research life cycle that could be uh, evaluated, not just the final product. It was me, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was saying before about uh, this need to try the authorship of the, of the collaboration. Uh, I was thinking it would make sense to have a sort of voluntary uh, connection to uh, other authorships, systems like Horsey, where you could connect to your profile in, uh, in Wikipedia with uh, their external ways, so you could have sort of identity tracking and then uh, maybe have some method that would transfer this information. Uh, do you think it would make sense to approach other organizations like my partnerships with them? I, I think it would. Uh, uh, some Wikipedia users already have their ORCID ID on their user page. I'm one of them. 
uh, and uh, I think the tools in order, uh, that would be needed to include Wikipedia contributions into a uh, Orchid profile, they do not exist yet, but they're on, on the list of uh, a number of people, uh, including those who, who run the Orchid Consortium. And so uh, some prototypes of that are not too far away. And if you have any concrete ideas uh, and, and want to step forward, uh, we're connected to those people, so you can start right away. Uh, all people here are probably the uh, open access enthusiasts, so we get the head picture that uh, the whole movement is evolving, is growing rapidly. Uh, but in my opinion, the truth is that the big players, the commercial players, are growing even more rapidly and they are growing bigger and bigger. And do we have a chance as a small player to do it, to break the system without the help of the government? Like you, you told us about some some American government programs that will help that. It help help it. But can we do it by our individual uh, activities? Or we just small ants <laughs> in front of the giants? Here, here the, the big uh, leverage of Wikipedia comes in. Yeah. Uh, like if you work on your own uh, university faculty uh, repository or journal or whatever, that is the ant work. And, uh, it helps uh, that there's many people doing this, we need many of those ants, but we have this large umbrella of Wikipedia. And if, for instance, uh, we, we come to the point that every reference comes with a signaling attached, it's, whether it's open access or not, then people will start to, to realize that this is an issue, that this is a property of a reference that they have to think about. And uh, this will help uh, convincing governments uh, to do something. It, it's not going to be easy. Yeah. Are very large but I think there is, there's, we are really honestly making a tremendous amount of progress. I mean, like I said, 11% of articles now are published in full open access journals. I think around 20% of all articles are available for free online somewhere. Um, and there's some, I obviously didn't have much time to, to show other stuff in my presentation, but there's some really interesting modeling that's been doing around open access, applying a model of uh, disruptive innovation and looking at whether open access trajectory looks like a disruptive innovation um, and sort of modeling what that trajectory might look like. And the author thinks that we might be at sort of an inflection point where the growth looks like sort of slow and steady now, but over the next five years, we could really start to see the curve bend upward and start accelerating um, even faster towards open access. Towards, uh, I can tell you like, I think a uh, thing that gives me hope about this is that I work in the University of Bologna uh, and I actually see uh, you know, professor, tenure professor, that we, they, they don't have money, you know, that there is this problem of the money. And so they, you know, start or uh, maybe uh, trans make a transition from, uh, you know, a paper journal to an uh, online journal, and we suggest them to do open access. They say, okay, so you could, and they are actually seeing that these things, you know, pays off. And we have more and more, we have like, you know, I can, I can tell you that we have, uh, uh, we have already 20 and we left probably 30 at the end of this year. So these things is, if professor understand that, uh, I think is a very good sign. Coming back to the ant perspective, something we can all do is kind of make use of the uh, reusability of the real open access material. Like if you put a video, an image into a Wikipedia article and then you can show this to your professor, uh, they will understand that this has impact. You can show them the page views on that page and this kind of stuff. As someone running an open access journal, what can I do to uh, make that easier for you? Um, what can we do to... We can talk later about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can talk later. That, that's the, the answer. <laughs> Wait, there is her. So I have two questions. Um, one's, as an non-academic, I'm wondering if you've seen any sort of Duplicate publication, you can't publish. You, you can translate some. Some journals will let you, if it's been in non English, you can then potentially publish it in another language, but only certain journals will allow you to do that, and you have to be clear. But otherwise, you can't oh, publish it. Oh, so, I, I would just like to clarify that open access, the status of open access, has no bearing on anything else about the article. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's peer reviewed or not peer reviewed, it doesn't mean that it's uh, plagiarism or not plagiarism, it doesn't mean that it's good research or bad research, like all of those things are 
equally likely if it's a paid journal or an open access journal. And, and the process of peer review, which is in the process of editorial work that would check for kind of duplicate publications and like, you know, duplicate research, um, all those things, that, you know, it, it's irrelevant whether the journal is open access or not. It's a different, different thing. So I guess putting it another yeah. way, if a researcher has uh, submitted an article to a journal for, yes. for review and then puts a link to it on his own website, like yeah. making it open to all so, that still, yeah. you can deposit it into an institutional Okay. Yeah, so some uh, publishers allow that, some don't. Some just most do, do, do that. that. Yeah, most do that. About two thirds allow it. Okay. And there what? Is a site that says that publishers yeah. Okay. And I think that what stops author to doing that is awareness of the problem, mainly. Like they, a lot of them could do that because the publisher allows it, but they just don't because they don't know Chef Romeo or stuff like that. On the other hand, people don't. I think can publish, and I, you know, we will for a long time, but like, don't read their license agreements. So when you publish an article, you are signing a contract, right? Yes. Like, like when you agree to download iTunes, except that it affects you more, right? Because when you publish an article, you're signing a contract about what you can do with that research. And your choices are, you can publish it in a, a closed access journal, um, in which case you're delegating more rights to the journal. You're giving them exclusive access in some way. Or you can choose uh, to sign away your rights in, a, in an open access journal. Um, not sign away, that's a bad way of doing it, but you can choose to publish in an open access journal in which, which gives you different conditions on your rights. Like, maybe you have more open. Repositories, that's not very common. I'm from Australia and we've got a couple of landmark, well, one landmark uh, radio program science show and a couple of landmark television programs. You should speak to someone in Australia. They're actually fantastic. Blue Boy, like QUT, the Queensland University of Technology. There are people from the research funders in Australia uh, that have policies that we can put you in touch with. Can you just want some Yeah, I'll, uh, afterwards I'll. There's a big meeting at, at QUT this November to ask Brisbane. actually a best practices guide to institutional open access policies um, in my parent organization is called Spark. Uh, if you go to spark.arl.org uh, and look under our initiatives tab, you'll see campus open access policies. And under that, there'll be a link to the best practices guide uh, that was developed with Harvard uh, and a couple of others that have institutional policies. There's also a guide online that's funded by a uh, method for this organization called Open Oasis. So it's open oasis, one word, dot org. Is everything you want to know about open access, either as a researcher, as a librarian, or a publisher, or a student. So. All right. Um, there is a session. Uh, there's a session in here at four, and so we should we should probably. Can I around. just say that there yeah. will be uh, there is open access week, you know, in yes. October. Yes. yes. So we should organize something, and you, I invite you all week. to go to the wiki project open access on English Wikipedia, so we can get in contact and organize something. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.